Resilience, Queer Professors from the Working Class, an anthology edited by Kenneth Oldfield and Richard Gregory Johnson III. This book was published in 2008 by SUNY Press in Albany, New York. This is an anthology with 14 chapters written by professors who are from the working class and queer. And um, overall, the professors um, featured in this book are older. They're from perhaps the silent generation, uh, baby boomer generation, not really too far below that. And so, so it gives some perspective on um, you know, older generations trying to fit into this academic work environment that is really structured for people like my father, who are um, straight white men, middle class, um, and, you know, from previous generations. And so one of my interests is how the academic institution as an occupational workplace is changing, especially as it tries to um, incorporate new demographics of professors into the workplace. And so I thought this book was really interesting. I do think it is good that we get this historical perspective because these are generations where, you know, it was really scary to come out as queer. Some of these folks were raised in the 50s, in the 60s, in the 70s, where, you know, they faced real discrimination within their families and within the workplace that perhaps um, you know, my generation, Gen X, or millennials don't face as much of. In this book, there were only two people of color, two men, black men, and so one of them is the co-author, and one of them is uh, another featured author in the book, and so it didn't include any um, women of color, um, immigrant women, um, and it also didn't have any um, transgender or bisexual people. So these were just like white men, white women, lesbians, gay men. So of course, one of the overall themes that all of the uh, participants wrote about was just their family life, of course, growing up, discovering their queer, discovering their uh, academic abilities, their interest in reading and how that might have marginalized themselves from their educational community as you know, children in grade school, children in high school. And plenty of them, of course, suffered um, major discrimination, stigma, prejudice from their own family members. So a lot of them really had to keep their queer identities secret from their family and even distance themselves from their family. So going away to college was really this moment of freedom where they could explore their sexuality, they could really uh, embrace their academic identity, and they could really thrive within an educational environment. Um, of course, all of them talked about growing up working class and the culture that that um, contributed to their lifestyle, to their perspective, and how they felt that the working class background that they had was really at odds with um, the academic environment that they were trying to fit in. And so um, they all went into detail about this kind of disconnect between how they've been raised, working class, what that means, what work looks like, you know, hard work, working on the farm, doing manual labor, and then how that contrasts to academic intellectual labor. And how in a lot of ways, um, manual labor, of course, is a lot more satisfying, you know, at the end of the day, you can really see what you've accomplished, whereas academic labor is really elusive and hard to really um, feel good about, feel productive about. So chapter three is called Middle Class Drag, written by Rennie Christopher. And the author talks about um, meeting, you know, classmates from college, they're going home to their family, and just seeing the middle class kinds of culture that, that um, their classmates experience and how alienating this was for her coming from this working class background. And so one of the topics that she talks about is um, just dress. You know, she was um, grew up as um, wearing, you know, uh, dressing a lot more butch as uh, a younger person in high school and realized that, um, you know, she had to start wearing skirts in graduate school, especially when she began to teach just to fit into this academic culture, this middle class kind of culture. And so um, just the disconnect between having to grow out her hair, but identifying as more of a butch lesbian and transforming, she states, 
transforming myself from a working class man into a professional middle class woman and that um you know she would dress this way and she called it middle class drag of course at the job to just kind of you know reduce stigma and blend in but this was definitely against how her uh, personal identity was experienced and so she said like only on campus would she wear a skirt and definitely that wasn't part of her um, you know, costuming outside of the profession. And so later, when she was more established in her profession, she switched her middle class drag into wearing more, um, you know, um, men's slacks and shirts and ties. And so, you know, presenting in, in, a, in a gendered manner that was more appropriate to uh, her identity, but also just staying within that middle class kind of um, drag, so moving from the black jeans into the shirt and tie. And so the author states, performing class is a type of drag for me as much as performing gender is drag. In chapter four, Timothy Quain's article is entitled, From the Altar Boy's Robes to the Professor's Cap and Gown. And he says, he opens the chapter by stating, I thought that higher education environment was a safer place for a gay man. Um, and that several colleagues, probably most of them, however, came from middle and upper class backgrounds. Many had parents who had been college professors or administrators. Some were children of physicians and lawyers. So already people that enter into the ac academic profession usually have this middle class background. They usually have professional parents. And so they were just raised and groomed their whole life into the um, cultural capital that is really implicit and inherent within the academic institution and you don't really even notice it if you are middle class if you're upper middle class if you are raised in this environment but for folks coming from the working class they really notice it because um they they run into this wall of um you know people judging them people uh criticizing their behaviors within this context and this author was entering um the higher education uh, in the late 70s. So there was a noticeable strain of homophobia, strongest among students, but also noticeable among some faculty and administrators. I wanted an environment more supportive of gay and lesbian students and faculty. And ultimately in, in chapter four, um, Timothy says that, um, to my knowledge, this was the first time a university official acknowledged a faculty member's gay partner. So just that his partner was acknowledged as his partner and just the, the difficulty of even getting to that point to be able to, to be out at work, to feel that that doesn't threaten the security of your job, to that it doesn't threaten your uh, relationship with other faculty and students. And then just to have that recognition that heterosexuals are always, always granted. As a heterosexual person, you can talk about your spouse and your children and your pet dog in the classroom. But for um, queer professors, you know, they really have to feel out that environment and it's always, it's never fully safe. You know, perhaps you think that, that it might be, but it's never, you never know who you're gonna offend. And so plenty of these folks in the book never ever discuss their sexual orientation within the classroom. That's never a point of safety. So chapter five is written by uh, Dr. Proventure called Teaching Tolerance for Class Differences, Ambiguity and Queerness in the Cultural Classroom. And this is written by someone who teaches French. And so just, um, there are at least two articles that talk about, you know, foreign language and um, uh, foreign culture uh, majors and how this created another kind of safe space for folks who are also queer or working class or somehow marginalized because this was an academic um, discipline where students were exploring different cultures and so that they parallel to exploring a different kind of identity culture and in this one they talked about how in the fall of 2003 their Straight and Gays for Equality student group asked this professor to come and be a speaker. And so, um, you know, this is one of the few authors in the book that was out enough that they were invited by a, a queer student group to, to be a representative on a panel. And very few of the authors mentioned um, queer student groups, so this is also shows 
the time period, you know, where you don't have those kinds of organizations on campus, you don't have out students, you don't have out professors, and therefore you don't have the students getting that kind of connection to other um, out professors and role models. A lot of the art authors in the book were also from the South, so they're talking about coming from a Southern culture. One of them was talking about their Confederate family background, um, you know, this kind of uh, white supremacist background, a very deeply religious, you know, background coming from the Bible Belt of the United States. And so a lot of these folks were deeply embedded in the South. They're working class, they're religious. And so plenty of them talked about these kinds of tensions of um, their families not accepting that, that they were gay, that they knew that they could never come out to their family, how big of a role religion played and how big of a role um, race and racism played within their um, upbringing. In chapter 9, uh, Felicia Yeskel talks about, um, the title of the article is My First Closet Was the Class Closet. And so she refers to this as uh, people's class transition. And so class transition came with a range of attendant emotions, dislocation, feeling different, excitement, feeling isolated, culture shock, and so on. I also learned to be ashamed of where I came from and how this is really embedded with the parental attitudes too, that a lot of the parents of um, these authors talked about how they felt alienated from education. They didn't have the college background and they felt that people like us don't go to college, you know, that this is for elite people in society, this is for uh, richer people in society. And so just that the parents had this feeling and they infused that onto these children that really wanted to break away from this family background and make it in academia. But academia was also a hostile place and didn't feel comfortable for folks coming from the working class and that they had to um, pretend that they had this kind of um, cultural capital or just be embarrassed about how some of their uh, mannerisms or behaviors uh, rubbed people the wrong way within the academic workplace and within their relationships. Chapter 10 by Dr. McDaniel is called One Bad Lecture Away from Guarding a Bank, Identity as a Process. So a lot of these folks talked about the working class jobs that they had and how, you know, they worked through their way through school and the, um, the lessons that they learned from their working class jobs and how that did or did not translate smoothly into the academic workplace. Plenty of them, plenty of the authors also found that academia was a very accepting place for them to talk about their sexual orientation. Perhaps it was the first time that they really felt accepted based on their sexual orientation and that class was now more of an issue than sexual orientation because the academic environment was more liberal as far as sexual orientation compared to their family background, their working class upbringing, their religious upbringing. And how, like in chapter 11 uh, by Donald Barrett, the chapter is called Becoming Almost One of Those Damn New York Pinko Intellectuals. And in, in this article, they mentioned that homosexuality back then was illegal and people did get arrested for it in those days. And so I think that that's something that we really need to remember is that, you know, homosexuality not long ago was a crime and um, something that could really just completely ruin one's life. Um, they could lose their, their spouse, they could lose their children, they could lose their job. Something that's really discussed a lot in this book is just geography. As academics, we, we can't really choose where we um, end up. And so, you know, in the last chapter, the, art, the author talks about, um, you know, Gregory Johnson talks about how, um, you know, he ended up in Vermont, you know, as a black man, a queer black man in Vermont, you know, in this um, very white state. And how, you know, as academics, we don't choose the ge geography of the location of where we get to work. And a lot of times, especially for queer folks, for more urban folks, um, you end up in a small town, you end up in a small college town, and so that is really not conductive to, um, to finding a partner if you're queer, to, to being out and just being able to, to have a queer culture to experience in the town that you live in, or to um, go to the gay bars and not run into your students there. 
The author Susan Borrego wrote chapter 14, which is called Hate is Not a Family Value. Growing up working class, how uh, in her neighborhood, no one ever talked much about what they wanted to do when they grew up. But then getting to college, the classmates there who came from middle class backgrounds really had a sense of um, ease on the college campus and just a, a sense of belonging that this author didn't have. Um, she states, I received no advice about types of degree, kinds of institutions, social and professional networking, and so forth. Only now, after watching people with more social capital successfully navigating the educational system, do I fully appreciate the importance of all this information, all this knowledge. So there's so much within the profession of academia that is based on elitism, you know, on, on being upper middle class within, within the academic institution. And so, for example, you know, what school you go to, it's not just a matter of the quality of education, because the quality of education you can get in a lot of places, but what the elite institutions really offer is a network of people who can help you later in life, get you jobs, get you connections, and so on. Or just that um, the title, like if you go to Princeton, then you're considered a certain, you've already passed that kind of threshold. And so, you know, you've already proven your elite status in society. And so folks will hire you like Wall Street recruits straight from Princeton because this is the caliber of people that they want to have. And so it's not about any kind of inherent intellectual ability, but it's just based on your elite status. And so within elites, within elite schools, you get this network, this social network of, of professional, successful people that can really help you. And within academia, I mean, the top programs, like in, in the field of anthropology, for example, it's like the top 10 programs in the field get all the hires for, um, you know, tenure track jobs. And so within academia, it's almost impossible to really get a job unless you go to one of the top schools. And if you go to a school like, you know, SUNY Albany, where this book is published, it's just going to limit your ability to get a job. But a lot of working class folks can get into state schools and, and you know, get a lot of student loans. But it's not really going to take you to that next level of getting employment. So one of the things overall that since the authors in this book are older, from older generations, um, you know, there are changes that we can see within the academic environment that are that are not covered in this book. The, for the first one is, I mean, they, they do mention it, but just not as much as it is for my generation and for millennials and younger, is the issue of student debt. So a lot of these, a, a lot of these authors did mention student debt and that they did take out loans, but it's not as much as later generations would really have to bear, especially for working class folks. So the issue of student loans and just the issue of um, these people all did become professors. So there's not this issue of, you know, becoming an adjunct or just getting your PhD and not being able to get a job at all. And so that is something that, you know, later generations are really going to encounter in a big way. Also, they don't I include other people of color or, um, you know, bisexual, transgender types of issues. And so those would be really great to um, you know, talk about in future um, books. So overall, you know, this is a really great book. There's not a lot of books on queer folks working within academia, first of all, and to have this kind of intersectional analysis that's at least talking about working class identity. Queer identity is significant, gender, um, you know, for women and so on. But, um, you know, there's a lot more to explore in future future works, but this is definitely a great contribution to understanding how um, sexual orientation faces structural barriers within the workplace, the professional workplace, and the academic workplace. So overall, a really interesting book, but you can definitely feel, um, you know, the dated nature of um, the, the experiences that are covered in this book. I'm interested in this book because I am working on a book talking about new generations of faculty in the academic profession. I want to talk about how, you know, tattoos and, and women and, and queer folks and a lot of other kinds of um, intersectional identities such as race, such as uh, immigrants and so on, and especially the issues that younger generations are facing within the academic workplace, such as 
taking out huge student loans, such as the mental health crisis in graduate school, such as, um, you know, adjunctification of uh, universities where 70% of all classes taught in, in the United States are taught by adjuncts and so on, that people can get a PhD and have um, no, no job prospects in the future of getting an academic job. So this is definitely an area where I'm reading a lot of books and want to study a lot about the academic workplace from um, you know perspectives that are marginalized within the academy. So resilience, queer professors from the working class is definitely a great contribution to this conversation. Thanks for listening to my review and let me know if you've read this book or you're interested in it, um, what your thoughts are.